It's gratifying. Oh, good. Oh, hello. Oh, oh, the, oh, good. The phone's ringing. Oh, they're calling from New York. Let's see who this is. This is not a bit. Uh, hello? Uh, good. Uh, no, no, uh, this is a, uh, we're, we're doing a live show now. Um, I don't know where the board op is. Uh, all right, cool, man, thanks. Oh, sweet. This is just Thank film, you very much. Film music Appreciate here. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Hey, wow. Just the, uh, level of... <laughs> professionalism that we have going on around here phones going off uh, asking me to board up some show in new york that makes sense and uh oh this is cool board button positions where we had the whole board here in the studio rejiggered today and i just got a cheat sheet from our super awesome uh engineer but uh the cheat sheet says board button positions for ad and homer why because homer the puppy is our co-producer on today's show as he often is <laughs> Uh, what were we saying before we were, uh, we, we were interrupted? I don't, I don't think, I don't remember. Uh, I don't think it's it gratifying yet. that people check in on t- via Twitter. Thank you. They, you know, it's just as gratifying as it is when people check in on Twitter, like Carmen and the real Sherry Jones and Jacob and Reaper Garcia, who sends us half naked pictures of Katy Perry to ease the pain that is a Tuesday. Um, it, it's super gratifying, and we like that. You'd think we'd feel the same way about phone calls, like, hey, but we're like, what the hell is this? Come on. No. Uh, anyways. I had a bunch more news that I wanted to get through, but we're rapidly running out of show. So let's just talk about the fact that if you get Ebola, it's NBC's fault. It's true. I don't know if you caught this or not. But uh, Dr. Dr. Nancy Snyderman. Did I say Doc D? I did. You ever have one of those days where your mouth just doesn't work? I'm having one of those days. It is... uh... Oh, that one's mine. Sorry. Are are you serious? For real? (laughs) <sighs> no, I'm just shambolic yeah. Oh, there you go. yeah yeah look it up that's what today's show is shambolic are, are we good to go Funkhauser? we're good to go all right who was it oh i don't know there's a sound effect <laughs> ah okay i, I got Doctor- you with that one Thank you. Thank you. Oh, wow. That's theater of the mind. You shouldn't have revealed it. You should have told me off the air, and then we would have been like, what? Uh, Dr. Nancy Snyderman. (laughs) This is a radio show that's being run about as well as uh, NBC's uh, medical editing department. Dr. Nancy Snyderman, NBC's chief medical editor and correspondent who was recently exposed to the Ebola virus, issued a statement on Monday night after reportedly breaking quarantine. Yeah, broke quarantine. She's 62 years old. She was in Liberia covering the latest outbreak in West Africa when she and other NBC crew members were exposed to Ebola. A freelance cameraman on the team was infected with the disease. He's currently being treated in Omaha. Getting back to the United States, Snyderman... And the rest of the crew told the CDC, as well as state and local health officials, that they would voluntarily remain in isolation for three weeks, as one needs to do when one is exposed to things like Ebola. Last Friday, health officials in New Jersey issued a mandatory quarantine for journalists. That's in effect until October 22nd. What's the date today, Funkhauser? Uh, 14th. Okay, yeah. yeah. So, in theory, she should have been in quarantine until the 22nd. It's the 14th now. However, several media reports came to light that claimed she'd been spotted October 9th at the Peasant Grill restaurant in Hopewell, New Jersey. She stepped out for fast food. It's true. On Monday, Snyderman issued a statement about the violation that was read by Brian Williams of NBC's Nightly News. While under voluntary quarantine guidelines, which called for our team to avoid public contact for 21 days, members of our group violated those guidelines and understand that our quarantine is now mandatory until 21 days have passed. We remain healthy and our temperatures are normal. Yeah. 
She also went on to say, as a health professional, I know we have no symptoms and pose no risk to the public, but I am deeply sorry for the concerns this episode caused. So if you get Ebola, it's sort of NBC's fault. Thanks a lot, NBC. Jeez. How how scared or not scared are you, Funkhauser, about the uh, idea of Ebola? Uh, well, have you given I mean, it any real thought? I'm a nail biter, uh-huh. you know, and you know that's you touch a doorknob, that's it. I'm sick. Yeah, um, and it, it's very scary. It's gonna, you, you know, if they don't cover it, it's gonna decimate the population. And we deal with people all the time, so it's kind of frightening. I'd give it an eight out of ten. Uh huh. I, I've uh, I'm trying like I wasn't a big handshaker before being the germaphobe that I am, but uh, I'm shaking hands even less now. Uh, just out of out of you know it's just I'm not really that worried. But I'm like, hey, why not cut down on shaking hands? You know, I, during cold and flu season, it's not a bad idea, and during Ebola season, it's really not a bad idea. And the thing is, it's not airborne. And I, I take. This is based, by the way, hear me on this. This is based on no scientific knowledge whatsoever. But do you ever, uh, you ever look back at history? And the Jews take a bad rap left, right, and center. They really do. Like, there's no two ways about it. And one of the ways in which the Jews took a bad rap was around the time of the bubonic plague, people claimed that the Jews were responsible for it. The Black Death was attributed to the Jews. Why? Why did the Jews shoulder the blame for the Black Death? Well, because they weren't getting it, and they weren't dying of it. So, naturally, people are like, oh, they're the only... There's this whole group of people that aren't getting infected by the bubonic plague. There's this whole group of people that are not dying from Black Death. Seems pretty clear-cut to us that they're responsible for it. They must be the uh, progenitors of the Black Death. And here's the thing. The reason Jews around the time of the bubonic plague were not getting black death is because they were keeping kosher, as it said in the Bible, you know, separate sinks and things like that, frequent hand washing. And because, you know, they were following the Old Testament rules for cleanliness and uh, the Old Testament rules for you know, the level to which you should cook your food and things of that nature, because they were following that, they were way less susceptible to bubonic plague. Hence, they, they got saddled with the blame for it. Interesting, right? And while it is wildly unfair that the Jews got saddled with uh, the blame for creating the Black Death, what can we learn from this particular lesson? We can learn that uh, in this time where people are scared of infectious disease, diseases, washing your hands frequently, probably not that bad an idea. Cooking your meat all the way, although I'm sure it's not connected to Ebola in any way, probably not a bad idea. Yeah, just be clean. Don't be a slovenly pig that lives in your own filth. Wash your hands after going to the bathroom. Try not to shake hands. And if you do, wash your hands afterwards. Look to the Old Testament Jews for uh, an idea of how to stay alive during this troubling time. I honestly uh, have no scientific evidence to back this up, but that's the one thing that makes me feel better about it. If, like, hand-washing, if frequent hand-washing by the Jews stop them from getting the plague, well, I have a feeling that my frequent hand-washing and my overall cleanliness, being the germaphobe that I already am, uh, put me in a better position than those that are not frequent hand-washers in these times of uh, concern over infectious diseases. Do you wash your hands frequently, Funkhauser? Are you, uh, are you, like, being a germaphobe in radio is really, really a common thing. Like, it sounds like a cliche, but it, it's absolutely true. Are you a frequent hand washer? At least twice a day. Uh-huh, yeah. I, uh, you know what I hate? I hate those, um, those, what, what are they even called? Pop filters? The things that we put on the end of the microphones? Oh, the the um, the the German fested fuzzballs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These big foam rubber things that we put over the ends of microphones to uh, stop things. Right, like everybody uses the same one, and they're like a community condom when you walk into a radio station where more than one person talks into a microphone. My favorite thing about this studio that we're in right now, it's not the most plush or updated or well equipped studio in this building that I'm in, but I'm the only person that uses it, or at least uses the microphone. 
everybody else in here is a board op and they get their little grubby little mitts all over the faders and things like that but I can wash my hands but I take great pleasure in knowing that my mouth is the only mouth that ever gets anywhere near this particular microphone and for that I am grateful I'm also grateful for human nature because in these troubling times where we don't know which way is up, we don't know which way is down, people are more divided than ever. People are existing in these digital bubbles created by the Internet that once connected folks and and bridge gaps in understanding and in cultures. And now the Internet just puts us in a bubble. If you're a, if you're a cross-burning idiot, it'll put you in touch with other cross-burning idiots so you can just hang around on Internet forums telling each other that you're right all the time. And that's bred huge gaps of understanding and hatred and, and ill will toward all. And we're all worried that uh, some person that believes a different version of God than our version of God is going to kill us. And, you know, we're probably right about that. And, well, in this day and age, Age where we seem to be getting further and further apart from each other in terms of humanity. Stuff like this is vital to the progression of the species, I think. Even a small act of kindness can have a huge impact. This is a huge act of kindness, though. 68-year-old Alan Law, former teacher in Minneapolis. And since he retired 15 years back, he's helped thousands of people every single week. Each night from 8 until noon the next day, Alan picks up sandwiches from church groups and charities. Then he drives around in his minivan, handing these sandwiches out to the homeless. And he never misses a day. The only time that he did was last year when he had prostate cancer and had to have surgery. But even then, even then, he snuck out of the hospital to do it. And despite the cancer, he still delivered over 520,000 sandwiches last year alone. He also gave away about 2,000 blankets and 3,000 pairs of socks. And this year, he's on pace to hand out even more sandwiches, around 700,000. He only gets three or four hours of sleep a night, and he always sleeps in his van. In fact, he doesn't even own a bed because his entire apartment is filled with 17 freezers to keep sandwiches in. Here's the thing. Alan says his goal isn't just to feed people. It's to change their lives. And aside from the actual food, the thing they need to know most is to know that someone cares about them, which is why he plans to keep doing it for the rest of his life. It's that thing. It's that last part of it, right? Like, what are you really doing other than teaching people their situation is okay if you're giving them a sandwich? You can sit here, you can get free sandwiches, and you can get blankets, and you'll be just fine. But if in addition to the sandwich, if in addition to the blanket, comes human kindness and compassion, well, that, that is the life-changing element. Thank you so much for being part of, uh, of my life-changing element. Fabulous show. We'll be back tomorrow. We'll do this all over again. Have yourself an awesome one.